and making all of you move. I had no idea there were this many of you. Um, and the men's lounge wasn't available. As you know, our guest today, um, who was sponsored by the speech, by the way, is sponsored by the, the Associated Student Speakers Program. Our guest is uh, Ralph Nader, um, author of uh, Unsafe at Any Speed, which was a recently a best-selling and controversial book dealing with uh, the safety defects in Detroit cars, primarily some of General Motors' early uh, Corvair models. Um, Mr. Nader, who was recently dubbed by Newsweek as every man's lobbyist, is uh, also, you may be interested to know, very much concerned about the unsanitary conditions in, in, in the meatpacking and fishing industries and about the harmful and indiscriminate use of x-rays. He, at his press conference this, well, just this morning, he um, outlined a six-point program for eliminating the internal combustion engine, and um, perhaps he, he'll be talking about that in his speech. His to the topic of his speech is corporations and consumers, and following it, there will be a question and answer period for those of you who can stay. Mr. Ralph Nader. Thank you, Mr. Grunfeld. Ladies and gentlemen, I must begin my remarks with a comment that I have found a difficult process of communicating some of these points to college audiences. I think this is a reflection of a deficient curriculum, by and large, and uh, at least a partially disoriented uh, understanding of how our political and economic system it works. Now, with that as a challenge, and I hope I'll be questioned on it afterwards, I'm going to boil down some of my remarks, which really spread over an hour and a half or so, and you don't have that much time, in order to outline uh, some of the uh, points that are of primary concern to me. The title of the remarks, as you've probably seen, uh, is The Corporation and the Consumer, which indicates that somehow these two uh, have a relationship. Uh, that this has to be said uh, <coughs> in 1968 uh, and has not been said very often in the past, at least with any specificity, is an indication of how we as a nation uh, tend to look at power system change primarily in governmental terms, that government is either doing too much, not doing enough, or not doing it properly. Uh, instead, I think of making a more useful distinction, uh, that is, distinguishing between generic power and, uh, and uh, sequential uh, power, or derivative power. And I think that if we ask ourselves, where is the generic power locus in the United States today? The answer will be in the large corporate structure. That much of governmental power is a creation of big business. It services big business. Uh, the two could not live without one another. And that the fortunes, privileges, and preferred positions of large corporations are very much a business of government uh, today. Not only with subsidies, but tax loopholes, privileges, a facile licensing uh, and the regulatory process which protects so many of them from the rigors of competition. The <coughs> burgeoning movement uh, of consumerism, as it was dubbed by some uh, deprecatory business commentators, uh, is in effect uh, much deeper than what uh, meets the surface. It goes much deeper. We're not only dealing with saving housewives with a few uh, pennies in supermarkets. Uh, the consumer movement has broadened in recent years to cover areas of product safety, such as foodstuffs, automobiles, and is now ranging to cover the most, uh, the most important area of all, that is, the contamination of the environment uh, by man-made efforts. Air, water pollution, soil contamination, and a whole host of chemical, radiation, and other hazards uh, that are now plunging head-on into the public marketplace an environment with nary a scrutiny for their secondary effects. Now looked at this way, and I think it's legitimate to look at it this way, judging by recent developments in Washington and elsewhere, uh, the consumer movement must ask the question eventually, 
uh, are we going to spend our days dealing with syndromes, uh, dealing with the end results, trying in effect to plug up little holes in the dike, or are we going to go deeper uh, to an understanding of the basic preconditions of corporate behavior uh, from which so much of these problems uh, flow? Uh, the nation, uh, for better or for worse, chose long ago uh, to have as its chief producer of goods and services the corporate mechanism. And it is this institution which I think deserves uh, much greater scrutiny at any level of our life, from university to government, uh, because it's this institution which has developed the kinds of uh, insulations from public responsibility uh, that uh, have too long gone uninvestigated. I want to be a bit more specific uh, in order to allow for more meaningful generalizations. Let's take three principal controversies in the product safety area and some remarks about environmental pollution as well. Now, when the meat controversy came up uh, and when the auto safety controversy came up, uh, the two greatest drawbacks uh, for uh, a thorough and speedy uh, oversight and monitoring of the problem was one, that they were subjected to a merger of business and government uh, dedicated to doing nothing. And secondly, they were intellectually boring. The very idea of people, say, at universities getting interested in auto safety and the wholesomeness of the food that we eat is something inexorably dull and pedestrian about this. I know at law schools, for example, you could get law students absolutely overexcited when you talk about a certain hair-splitting principles in legal accounting. But then when you talk about what are we going to do about regulation of our food uh, products, uh, you get nothing but yawns. If you can keep a subject intellectually boring, uh, deliberately or un unconsciously, you can in effect insulate it from the kind of critical scrutiny of the intellectual elite in this country. Now, the meat controversy is a case study of how state departments of agriculture, the industry, the two committees in Congress and the U.S. Department of Agriculture roughly had the same priority. That is, no ne more ne legislation was needed, no rocking the boat. Uh, the situation was uh, about as well as could be expected of it. Except that, of course, it wasn't. Except that at least 8 billion pounds of processed meat weren't getting any inspection worthy of the name. That's about 25 percent of, uh, of the processed meat supply in the nation every year. Uh, not only were there uh, purchases and uh, use for human consumption of 4D animals, dead, dying, diseased, and disabled animals, but the sanitation level of some, many of these plants was absolutely incredible to behold, and the use of often illegal or indiscriminately uh, legal uh, chemical additives, colorings, preservatives, seasonings, all in effect to mask the true condition of the meat, uh, so that the consumer didn't know what he was uh, buying. Now, this to me is a pretty important situation. Uh, yet again, you see, it is not stylized properly for intellectual study, for intellectual curiosity. It's considered rather pedestrian. Unfortunately, uh, or rather fortunately in this case, uh, there was a visible malaise that could have been, uh, that could be articulated. And with the disclosures of conditions in meatpacking plants and elsewhere, uh, the public got rather agitated, at least enough of the public got rather agitated uh, to begin demanding further investigations and complaining uh, to Congress, to the White House, and elsewhere. That's enough of a feedback, by the way. That's enough of a feedback to make some of the political representatives uh, very interested in such proposed legislation. Letters have a peculiar impact uh, on senators and congressmen. Uh, at least if they don't come, uh, they almost uh, mean the kiss of death. If they do come, there's a probability that they'll do something, a probability that they may not do something. But if they don't come, the issue is generally considered not of much interest to a legislator. <clears throat> when the uh, issue first arose in the summer of 67, the odds of getting legislation were minuscule because of these four institutions, which I mentioned, who had no interest in it. You were locked in legislatively uh, from the executive branch and from the industry and state levels as well. What finally did it was, of course, this 
disclosure of the surveys and studies and various conditions around the nation publicly. Now, what's interesting about this problem, among other things, is that the feedback did not come from uh, the more formally educated uh, people in the United States. They were more concerned about uh, whether Tweedledum or Tweedledee was going to be nominated for president. This feedback didn't come from them. The same was true in auto safety. The feedback came significantly enough from blue collar levels, from Aunt Mamie's in Dubuque, uh, from what might uh, be concerned, considered the non-articulating citizenry, citizenry uh, in the nation. But I have found that they have a sense of the essential, the sense of the essence, that very oftentimes escapes the more active citizens who are often overgeneralized uh, beyond repair. <clears throat> the auto example, of course, illustrates many, many significant uh, deficiencies in corporate structure. If, a con if an industry can become concentrated with a dominant product firm such as General Motors controlling over 50% of the market, several things can happen. First of all, it can control the rate of technological information that's made public. If it controls the rate of technological information, the public does not realize the discrepancy between what it is getting in terms of product quality and safety and what it can get. Uh, the consumer is not given uh, the kind of information that allows him to develop a critical capacity for dissatisfaction with shoddy workmanship or, uh, or stagnant uh, workmanship in terms of the technology. And this is exactly uh, what happened. I'll take it from your own experience. Uh, assume you went down to a dealer to purchase a new car and you told them that you just read Adam Smith and were a believer in classical economics and the open market system. And as a believer in that system, you knew that the essential prerequisite and justification for its utility is that you have a meaningful choice of product and a meaningful fund of information on which to make that choice. And so you say, uh, I want to shop around and compare various cars. Would you tell me what the safety performance level of your vehicle is? And he scratches his head and I'm sure mutters a few things under his breath and then says, well, uh, this car can go from zero to 60 miles an hour in 8.7 seconds. And that's important for emergency reserve power, particularly on super highways. And you say, well, that sounds reasonable. How long does it take for this car to go from 60 miles an hour to zero? <laughs> well, he can't tell you this. The manufacturer won't tell him. He can't tell you a lot of other things, such as the vehicle handling performance, the tire performance, the visibility, uh, the crash worthiness, the strength of the door structure, etc. He can't tell you this, and neither can any other manufacturer or dealer across the street. Now, if you don't know this information, you cannot make the kind of informed judgment in the marketplace that penalizes the shoddy manufacturer and rewards the better one. Now, how can this be when the manufacturers are continually giving lip service to the open market system and free enterprise? The fact is that they are interested in neither. They are interested in a closed market system and a controlled enterprise uh, system. The best evidence of this, of course, aside from the cars and the stagnation that is documented from, uh, from uh, many years uh, in, the, in the past, ranging from the huge lag between the adoption of disc brakes in some cars in Europe and the adoption of optional equipment in the United States, and the huge lag in terms of radio ply tire adoption, just to give two very pedestrian uh, and well better known illustrations. Uh, aside from that, I think one of the most fruitful analysis to make is to analyze the information content of the communication system between manufacturer, dealer, and customer. Basically, we get most of our information about new cars from the manufacturer or through the dealer. And what kind of information system is it? Clearly, it is not oriented toward giving you meaningful uh, content so you can compare makes or models or even so that you know what this particular car can do. The information system is built uh, to appeal to, as a Madison Avenue copywriter told me once, uh, to stir the animal. The basic appeals are quite clear. Look at the advertisements, power, aggression, decor, luxury, vacation land image, sexual illusions, and so forth. 
Now the reason here is not ephemeral and it's not super, superficial. It strikes me and has always struck me ever since I delved in this subject that it is one of the most impressive exercises of applied social science that this economy has ever produced. And I think it should be studied as such. The effect of this kind of advertising is twofold. It displaces uh, more relevant content and it diverts the attention of the consumer so that he begins to wonder whether uh, the difference between next year's car and this year's car uh, is whether the grill pattern is going to grimace or grin. Uh, no other manufacturing industry has succeeded in so brainwashing a consumer that they take the most expensive consumer durable in the United States, like a Mustang, and they sell a 1967 Mustang as an all-new Mustang, and then they sell a 1968 Mustang as an all-new Mustang, when the principal difference between the two was that in 1967 you had uh, the, uh, the uh, simulated air vents on the side as optional equipment and this year you have them as standard equipment. That is, in 1967 you had optional fakery, in 1968 you have standard uh, fakery. Now, uh, this kind of attitude built up over the, over the years has really turned uh, motorists and consumers into imbeciles in terms of their inability to become uh, the minimal uh, critics uh, of the product that they are buying. Let me give you a few illustrations of the ads uh, just to reify the discussion a bit. Uh, here's one ad for Buick which says, when you get behind uh, these, this 380 horsepower dynamo, quote, you'll feel as if you'll, you'll, you have your own personal type of nuclear deterrent, end of quote. Another says similarly the same introduction uh, with the ad additive that, quote, you can start billing yourself as the human cannonball, end of quote. Another ad urges a driver to, quote, drive it like you hate it, it's cheaper than psychiatry, end of quote. The Firebird was peddled uh, earlier, early last year in various trivial versions. You know, that's just a warmed up Camaro. Uh, the Firebird was peddled to the female audience on radio in the following uh, version. Quote, uh, girls, do you believe in love at first sight? If you do, you'll want to buy a Firebird because you'll feel better, look better, be better in a Firebird when you're with all those boys before the envious eyes of all those girls. Fall in love with a Firebird, fall in love with a Firebird. End of quote. Now, you see the associational psychology that's involved here. But not to be outdone, Mercury Cougar comes in last year with an ad beamed to the male audience on radio, which says very simply and concisely, quote, men, when you drive a cougar, you don't cruise, you prowl, end of quote. <laughs> and for those of you who have dabbled in anthropological <laughs> studies, Lest uh, you become a bit condescending toward, th toward those primitive tribes in New Guinea with all their totems and animisms, uh, consider for a moment how we name our cars. A stingray, barracuda, cougar, wildcat, cobra, cutlass, comet, meteor, thunderbird, mustang, marauder, literally defined as one who pillages and lays waste the countryside. <laughs> Against this menagerie on the highway, it's consoling to take note, at least, that Chrysler has a car named Dodge. <laughs> now, all of this is as entertaining as it is designed to be. Because when you have this kind of reaction and expectation and titillation and stimuli, you're not about to start doing the following things, such as saying, look at the bumper structure on this new car. What an insane configuration. Its main purpose is to protect itself. And it such, does such a bad job of that that we have a multi-million dollar industry selling us bumper guards. What other industry can pile up profits on the basis of its previous blunders? The auto industry. Now how can a rational or a sensible society tolerate bumper structure which will allow tremendous damage in very low collision impacts, even parking bumps where a grill pattern can be smashed, uh, and yet not do anything about it. Do you realize that bumpers are now designed by the auto industry's own standards 
to withstand a collision no more than two miles per hour. How can this be done? It can be done because of the lack of critical information being fed to the consumer. He's turned basically into an imbecile, as I said, in response to this kind of design. And look at it all the way, from the external configuration of sharp edges, cutting edges over the headlamps, blade-like bumpers, the former dagger fins and hood ornaments, whose main purpose was to protect uh, vehicles from pedestrians. There's no other purpose that I could think of, at least. <laughs> and consider the internal part of the vehicle with the kind of design of the dash panel, steering column, uh, windshield, uh, poorly uh, anchored seats, and so forth, what could mean the difference between life and death in low-speed uh, collisions. Now, this is a type uh, of stagnation, or let's put it this way, the type of uh, domination of stylistic pornography over engineering integrity that has caused uh, the vehicle design to be uh, anything but designed for human safety and human, uh, and human quality, and performance, and protection. This could never have happened, I submit, if we had a different industry structure, one that was more competitive, uh, and a different consumer marketplace climate that demanded more of the industry in terms of innovation and uh, information. Now, against this background, it's not surprising that for 60 years we had an extremely uh, prehistoric, primeval approach to traffic safety. That the general establishment led by the National Safety Council, which is really nothing more than a front for the auto industry in this area, uh, and funded by various industry groups uh, around the country, the kind of attitude toward traffic safety represented uh, roughly the state of knowledge in medicine about 1800. Uh, it was all explained in terms of driver failure, uh, or as some people put it, the nut behind the wheel. Now it's quite clear that in any man-machine relationship, the adequacy of the operator is a function not only of his skill and temperament, but also of the adequacy of the instrument that he holds in his hand. And just as you can say, that if all drivers were perfect, there would be no crashes. I can say that if all vehicles were perfect, there'd be no crashes, because we'd have detection devices that would anticipate collisions and actuate the braking systems. And I dare say that that is far more likely to transpire uh, than is the advent of the millennium of the perfect driver. Uh, secondly, let's take the argument of the nut behind the wheel advocates at its most extreme. Let's assume that every single crash is due to driver failure, just arguendo. Even where the bridges fall down, they say the driver should have foreseen this and averted the situation. Then the question remains, how do we know how to choose the various policy priorities that will cut down on deaths and injury? And if we ask ourselves, let's say just four criteria, which policy is the most effective, which lasts the longest, which is the most easily administered, and which is the cheapest, then the vehicle's role takes a very, very high priority indeed, because it is basically a far more controllable variable and a far more easily administered system uh, than the expectation of perfection at all times under all conditions with unsafe vehicles on the part of the human operator. Now, to give two simple illustrations, illustration one, uh, <clears throat> studies in Britain and elsewhere have shown that some of the most immediate proximate causes of a crash uh, stem from locking of the braking system. Now, we can try to teach 95 million drivers how not to lock their braking systems. Bring them all into class, get the teacher up there, film, visual aids, and then take them out on a proving ground for an hour, spray the pavement with water, and show them how not to lock their braking system. And then we can hope that this cognitive knowledge stays with them five months or five years from now and instantaneously is put to use during an emergency. That's one way to do it. Another way is to build into the vehicle system anti-locking braking systems where you couldn't lock your brakes even if you passionately desired to do so. Now you see on these four criteria which is the preferred policy priority. If we go to the second collision area where the immediate contact between man and vehicle or more specifically, man and instrument panel, man and windshield, man and ejection through the door, uh, man and, and uh, imp impalement on the steering column. If we go into these areas, then the choice basically is between 
trying to do something about the human head or human physiology in terms of improving the resistance to energy transfers, uh, or trying to do something about uh, steering columns, windshields, uh, and uh, dash panels, as is now finally being uh, worked on, uh, to improve their crash resistance. Now, I understand, I may be wrong, but the human physiology has not changed much in the last a half million years in terms of its ability to withstand force. But the instrument panel and all the other designs of this inanimate vehicle uh, can be modified drastically to take tremendous forces in terms of impact of human heads and so forth quite uh, safely. Boiled down to its essentials, the choice basically is between eugenics or engineering. And even if we knew how to do the former, it would take at least an 18-year lead time uh, to uh, begin uh, the input here. <clears throat> the engineering approach, of course, in any man-machine relationship is the mark of the progress of material civilization. Whether it's the difference between the Mayflower and Gemini 8, the difference between the straight razor and the electric razor, the difference between the old elevators and the automatic elevators, the difference between machinery in our plants without fail-safe components and machinery with fa fail-safe uh, components. It took a very long time uh, for these lessons to be applied to automotive safety. Uh, for the age when people were killed in collisions as low as 10 miles an hour, uh, for this type of principle to take root. And I think 20 years from now, we'll look back on these times uh, when the accident or the crash injury rate was at such a uh, level that one out of every two Americans will either be killed or hospitalized because of motor vehicle crashes. We'll look back at the time when people were killed or seriously injured at 20 mile an hour impacts, 30, 40, 50, 75 percent of all motorists are killed in impacts, impact speeds under 50 miles an hour, incidentally. We'll look back at those times, I hope, with a kind of revulsion and disbelief that we look back at the conditions in many of our plants at the turn of the century. Now, the basic inquiry here is how could this all have happened? And it all happened because of unbridled corporate power, unaccountable corporate power, lack of adequate disclosure requirements, lack of adequate sanctions, lack of adequate public state safety standards to develop external standards of excellence for industry's performance, lack of adequate competition in an oligopolistic or concentrated industry, lack of uh, effective uh, entries for new systems and new entrepreneurships, which is another way of saying too high a barrier of entry to these industries, uh, which is also another way of saying inadequate antitrust enforcement. Now, all these boil down, I think, to uh, meriting a close look at the corporate structure, where it is heading, and, and how it can be made more accountable. The genius of corporate power uh, for accommodating potentially countervailing systems of power to it, I think, is unparalleled. They have done it with the labor unions, where labor union after labor union is now basically accommodated and comfortably nestling in the corporate layer. And if the trend goes on, and I hope the UAW uh, eviction or liberation, whichever way you want to look at it, of last week changes this tide, but at the present rate of, of union accommodation with corporate power, somebody in about 20 years will be able to write the history of the labor union under the title uh, company union to company union in two generations. Government power, again, very, very effectively undermined, subverted, and taken over to suit corporate purposes. The documentation here uh, would bring me, uh, bring me uh, to many hours of discussion. We can discuss it afterwards. But it, regulatory agency after regulatory agency basically is a hostage of the particular industry that it is supposedly regulating. Uh, to give you an illustration in the Interstate Commerce Commission, uh, the motor bus carriers wrote in the law in the 30s that no accident reports by the Interstate Commerce Commission of bus accidents would ever be made public. That is, except under the table to the bus companies. So people who were victimized in bus accidents far away from home, with no way to get recourse in courts, without adequate factual in uh, investigation, were deprived of even looking at these accident reports which the taxpayer financed. Now, for years, Greyhound Bus Company, uh, has been making a lot of money. The corporation has made so much money that it now owns 30 Boeing 707s and 727s. 
And of course, over the years, it has achieved this admirable liquid uh, state uh, by cutting costs. One of the areas it's cut costs on has been its rear tires, regrooving and regrooving them uh, in a pattern which gives little more traction than the smooth tires, uh, particularly on wet pavement. Accidents began occurring. California, two years ago, Arizona, deaths and injuries. Uh, the typical uh, accident was a Greyhound going off, single bus accident off a highway, often slippery and over an embankment. Finally, a crash occurred in New Jersey. And because of the publicity attendant upon that crash and the role of uh, very, very badly regrooved tires in the crash, the uh, legacy, the pr excuse me, the successes of the interstate commerce uh, Bureau of Motor Carrier Safety, which is now over in the Department of Transportation, decided that the law should finally be enforced. There was a law against uh, this kind of regrooving. And recommended was criminal prosecution of Greyhound Corporation. And if Greyhound Corporation is successfully prosecuted and convicted, the maximum fine is $500. Now, why should that shock you? There are far more shocking illustrations. Take the Allison Division of General Motors, which early last year discovered that a number of its planes, uh, its engines, developed a soft piston problem, which leads to propeller loosening and spinning off into the fuselage. This is a defect that is so serious that any prudent manufacturer, once discovering it, would immediately notify the airlines to ground and disassemble the planes. Uh, Allison Division did nothing of the sort. While they were pondering their corporate image and neglecting even to notify the Federal Aviation Agency, a Lake Central's plane, Convair 580, with the soft piston problem, crashed, killing 38 people. The investigation showed that it was due to the soft piston defect. The Federal Aviation Agency decided that the time had come to penalize Allison Division, particularly since in the previous five years, the division was cited without penalty for 116 manufacturing irregularities in propeller production. So they fined Allison Division $8,000, resisting the pressures of the parent company, General Motors, uh, from reducing the fine to, to $4,000. So we mustn't be too harsh on the agency. Now, I give these examples to illustrate uh, how divergent the sanctions are in this nation for individual misbehavior and individual misbehavior be behind a corporate structure. A person who forges a $200 check can go to jail for a year or two years. But a number of large electric companies, such as GE, Westinghouse, Alice Chalmers, etc., can engage in a 15-year willful price conspiracy, price-fixing conspiracy, uh, and be convicted under the criminal provisions of the Sherman Act in 1961 and then be exposed to treble damage payments by overcharged customers, and then pay out in settlements out of court a total of about $500 million. And what was the penalty? The penalty was six-week jail term for a few executives, which is the first such term under the Sherman Act. Here was a willful price-fixing conspiracy under the criminal provisions of the antitrust law. That was the fine. Now, how about the civil sanction of the, of the trouble damage suit? $500 million was paid out. Well, because it was known that this sum was going to have to be paid out, General Electric and General and uh, Westinghouse decided that they should do something about it in terms of a little bit of socialism. Mind you, corporations are not against socialism. They're against certain kinds of socialism, but they are not against socializing their risk on the backs of the public taxpayer. So they went to the Internal Revenue Office uh, via the representation of a pr prominent Washington attorney who persuaded the Internal Revenue Office to issue a new ruling allowing punitive damage suits as a result of criminal conviction under the antitrust suits to be deducted as ordinary and necessary business expenses. That attorney is now Secretary of Defense. Now this is an illustration of the tremendous flexibility of corporate institutions to transfer misbehavior, to transfer uh, the risks onto the public uh, with little impunity. And I think if we have to ask ourselves the basic question, it is that may, most of the problems of environmental pollution proceed from corporate behavior, 
whether it's air, water, or soil. And that this kind of behavior needs to be brought under a far more rigorous legal and market control. That is, we need both law as restraint, law as prohibition, law as gestator of new research and development, publicly identifiable, uh, law as uh, procurer of uh, prototype innovations to get the ball rolling, and law as liberator of the market system uh, so as to enhance the critical capacity of even small numbers of consumers around the country. Uh, this latter function can be done by requiring more and more information uh, to be made explicit at the point of sale in terms of the products that are sold. In terms of corporate reform, more disclosure, more public standards, more sanctions, uh, more corporate citizenship, and more competition. And this simply is not going to be done by wishing it on Washington. It's only going to be done by a broader understanding, uh, hopefully among the articulate citizenship or citizenry, of what is generic power in this country and what is uh, cons uh, derivative power. We're not just talking about abuse of corporate power. We're talking about the rigorous non-use of legitimate corporate power. The rigorous non-use of legitimate insurance industry power vis-a-vis -vis the auto industry over the years to produce safer vehicles. That is one of the prime examples of how this so-called countervailing system doesn't countervail but rather accommodates. Uh, that the insurance industry which on paper should have a vested stake in loss prevention and safety of the environment and of the product has in effect gone the other way taken the higher loss claims and gone toward uh, the pathway of higher premium uh, rates uh, from the policy holder. Again, this type of reorientation away is due to many factors, not the least of which is the inability in the present situation in this country of one industry to vigorously countervail or try to discipline another industry uh, when their ideal stakes uh, are at cross purposes. Instead, we get a distortion, and the bill is paid by the public instead of turned inwardly on the safety and integrity of the various systems that are uh, subjected to insurance uh, coverage. This wasn't the way it was in the early days of Lloyd's of London, uh, when these men in the coffee shops uh, were extremely vibrant forces requiring the operators of the ships to undertake certain safety measures ranging from lifeboats uh, to precautions against fires and uh, to establishments of life of uh, lighthouses uh, to guide the ships in uh, treacherous waters. And so in conclusion, I think it's important just to reiterate generally, uh, hopefully enough concrete exposition has been made here uh, to make it less than a generalization without support, that we need uh, some kind of attention given to how we are going to handle uh, a corporate structure in this country that by 1975 is going to hold in 200 corporate hands three quarters of the manufacturing assets. At the present time, it's about two thirds of the manufacturing assets in the nation. Uh, how are we going to deal with this problem uh, if the attention and the sense of what is important among the more dynamic elements of our people is oriented in other directions? Uh, that the enemy and the op opponent is far too often considered to be government rather than what lies behind government. Uh, whether it's a civil rights movement or the uh, movements in, in environmental safety, you'll notice the pleas are primarily made to government, to legislative action. But all of these pleas, even if they are symbolically accepted uh, and legislation is instituted, are simply not even going to begin to do the job unless there are private groups and private organizations working full-time, and I emphasize full-time, on as professional a basis, legal, medical, scientific, as those who represent industry interests on the processes of government. And this, to me, is the critical uh, need at the present time to create new career roles for young lawyers, doctors, engineers, and scientists so they can promote the primary objectives of their profession. Uh, outside of uh, private practice uh, where it can only be promoted. A lawyer cannot basically push 
for illegal restructuring of the auto safety system in this country uh, while he represents private clients. Uh, he can win a case or two with some general applicability, but basically speaking, whether it's in preventive medicine or preventive law or preventive or remedial engineering, we need new career roles in the public interest area, uh, <coughs> structured perhaps around firms at the state capital and federal capital levels, working on these problems full time, dredging up issues and information never before dredged up, feeding back into universities and other centers of knowledge and analysis a sense of what is important uh, so that they can incorporate uh, a sense of what isn't relevant into their educational process, along with a sense of what is excellent. I think this is the kind of social innovation that is going to eliminate many of these non-technical obstacles uh, to uh, engineering innovation. The tragedy of many of our problems is that we now, unlike many years ago, have the technological answers, but we also have very deeply entrenched uh, social, economic, and political obstacles uh, to the utility or application of these technological remedies. And until we attack it at that level, uh, all of these technological remedies and fixes will remain uh, gleams in the eyes uh, of inventors uh, or gathering dust on the shelves of corporate uh, offices. Thank you very much. Do you want to have a question? Those of you who are interested in asking questions, why don't you come up to the front and as close as you possibly can. We'll just give it a minute until those of you who have to leave do so. The question was uh, about the efficacy consumers union. Well, what we need to do basically is to integrate uh, the computer revolution with the consumer revolution and develop a system of, of information about products, uh, product quality and quali product safety in a national computer network fed in uh, from various testing labs and so forth, government data and disseminated through point-of-sale uh, uh, machines. For example, you'd go to a, a shopping center, there'd be a machine there, you'd put in uh, whatever is necessary in terms of money or whatnot, and out would come uh, the data, comparing various products, telling you whether indeed this type of bleach is giving you anything more than this other type of bleach, even though the price differential is 25% because of the brand name. Uh, that is the most effective type of consumer information. Monthly magazines, rather inefficient, uh, and b largely going to those who need, need the information least. Point of sale, hopefully, is the next uh, development. Now, you see, here's another illustration. At our universities, there's a lot of work going on, computer uh, development, application, thinking, consulting, so forth. In what areas? You know, industrial application, defense, space, merchandising, Who's doing work in terms of the computer and the consumer? A development that could revolutionize consumer protection in the country. Now, this is an example of how both the curriculums and the research patterns at universities are the mirror image of what is commercially viable uh, in the society at large. They're being led, you see, instead of leading. And this is nothing new. Uh, as part of what uh, underlies many of these student revolts at universities. Uh, it's the theme of a new book that's coming out by James Ridgway on the universities in July, uh, and it's, uh, it's old hat, at, for example, law schools, the Harvard Law School, for example. It's a perfect illustration of a, a highly professionalized minion uh, to a corporate law practice. You had all kinds of, of courses uh, proliferating on tax and estate planning, and corporate law and securities reg, and virtually nothing in the areas of criminal law and tort law. They were dispensed in the first year and when I was at law school, they were almost going to reduce the one-year course in criminal law until the Supreme Court began coming out with certain decisions and money began flowing in to make this kind of research respectable. Then they began developing course curriculum. 
uh, basically the law schools have not led in this area uh, at all. They have been reflective of the needs of the dominant corporate practice instead of reflective of the needs of the public interest in, uh, in what the law uh, must adapt and be re responsive to. Yes? Well, I'm, yes, this deals with the question of organizing these private public interest firms and my involvement in developing one. Yes, I am in the process of uh, trying to start a, a group on a very small scale, and hopefully it will be underway before the end of the year. Uh, the question is, what specific projects and industries will we have under review? You know, it's like virgin territory. Uh, you can almost uh, flip a coin. Uh, but I think uh, the basic theme will be uh, the corporate structure, its internal organization, its performance vis-a-vis -vis the public, and its influence over government. It will be taken on a case-by-case -case basis. See, here, here's the great difference in this type of work from prior social criticism. Prior social criticism basically involved writing the books and then retreating to the college on the lake uh, and, and uh, answering mail, you know. What we need here is a full line service of analysis, disclosure, implementation, follow through, and continuous oversight. That's one. Uh, second of all, I'm sure you've read a lot of critiques in the past, of the corporate system. You notice how thin they are in documentation? case studies. Look at Galbraith's critique. He uses data, you know, like on Ford that's 40 years old. It's about the latest, uh, the latest materials that apparently have come to his attention to illustrate that point of view. Obviously, it's an erroneous point of view because 40 years have passed uh, since then. He has no concept, for example, of the uh, tremendously cost-cutting impact of the new technologies, uh, which have reduced certain barriers of entry which existed almost in, in, in an impenetrable penetrable manner uh, before that. This is the subject of a recent Senate hearing by Senator Hart and the Antitrust Committee. Uh, you see, they're very thin on this. And the whole uh, point is to build up your documentation and document your cases all along. And uh, students can play a great role here because, A, uh, they're as free as, as they'll ever be in their life to perceptively in investigate a subject. Uh, B, they are at the peak of their idealism before they become suburbanized or uh, unmoored drifters like Latin American students, you know. Uh, B, uh, C, uh, they, uh, they uh, are up to date. I mean, you know, they are not obsolete. They may be uh, thin and experienced and whatnot, but they, they are not obsolete. They are not trammeled by past and ancient uh, conceptions. And all of these papers that they write, and these PhD theses and MA theses, they can make just magnificent contributions, each one. Just take specific areas, do field research, none of your theoretical library work, uh, and, and just organize. If they pick areas where they're interested in the subject, they think something should be done about the subject, that normative impulse, if kept within bounds for objective purposes, can be a very, very dynamic impulse for a much more creative intellectual process, one that's far more indelible than the usual process of writing a paper by going to the library, getting your critical mass of 10 or 15 sources, footnoting them with an innocent plagiarism, and passing them in as a paper. He had precedent. Yes. The question is whether the institutions in the United States would be ever capable of making corporations serve instead of exploit. This I take as a typical SDS inquiry, <laughs> which, is, which is a very meaningful one, very meaningful one. Let me answer it this way. It's quite clear that the institutions in this country uh, were malleable enough to allow uh, Columbia University in the last two months to do a lot of thinking and a lot of reforming. The very institutions you see which were supposedly to be completely driven off and replaced. Now, basically the answer to your question is, the answer to your question is that uh, there's no clear demarcation anymore. In the old days you could say, well, government, 
should take over, nationalize, uh, or other utopian schemes. The society is so complex now, it's such a melange, that the question is, what, what is a strategy for any given institution? Uh, and what are the means of change? Th those are the basic uh, foci as I see it. For example, I don't think it's, there's much of a difference between uh, the U.S. Post Office and General Motors in terms of their invulnerability to change. Uh, bureaucracy has a certain common uh, behavior about it. And you can have very tyrannical government institutions as well as corporate institutions. Now, the answer to that, to that point, from, say, others, uh, say we should decentralize this. Now, it isn't really uh, private or public. It should be decentralized. So then you come up with the question of how do you, uh, um, how do you still get things done uh, with the requirement of very complex organizations being, I think, uh, uh, a essential precondition of, of attaining what we want to attain. Uh, what's the price of decentralization, that is, in this area? Now, I'll tell you when I'll start getting very worried. First of all, when people are despaired because General Motors or some other group is not performing uh, properly or responsibly, I would think that they would at least wait until about 50 people in this country are working full time to make them res respond responsibly. How can you despair of a system if there's nobody working full time to change it? A. B, as long as the ideal still maintains hegemony in this country, you have the basic metabolism for reform. As long, for example, as certain democratic precepts are still recognized even by those who lacerate them, you still have hope. Once the ideal begins to be subverted and, and, uh, and in effect conformed to the practice, which is far removed from the ideal, then we're really in trouble. And that is beginning to appear, of course, in certain areas. For example, our foreign affairs in this country are virtually uncontrollable by any democratic process. I think a legitimate comparison can be made as to whether the Soviet people have more control over their foreign affairs than the American people. The State Department and the Pentagon basically have now grown into a kind of evolution or devolution, whichever word you wish to make, that they are no longer accountable. You can't find out the basic facts, uh, what, it, what touch us all, what will affect our whole destiny because of the so-called classified security umbrella that covers everything. Now, this is an area of real danger. I'm not convinced yet that the point in the corporate world has reached that point in terms of domestic policy. But in the area of foreign policy, uh, it's a very, a very serious question whether uh, it can be recouped. The question is, what kind of car do I drive? The answer is that I've given up owning a car <laughs> for several reasons. One, it can be misconstrued as a product endorsement, and no car deserves that type of endorsement. Two, a car is to be used for mobility. When it becomes a means of immobility, as it does in downtown Washington, there's no need having it. A C, I believe in transportation as a service and not a chore, and prefer public transportation between cities where I can read and sleep instead of grunt and swear as I maneuver through traffic. And a new reason is beginning to crop up. I think, uh, I think we should uh, try to limit our ownership of cars as a contribution uh, to the safe society. And I think there's a point where the gluttonous consumption of these vehicles is definitely harmful, and if we can get along without them, as many can who live in the inner city, uh, certainly get along without two, uh, then we should. Yes? There's a comment to comment on food and drug regulation. I think the best way to answer that is to cite a, a study uh, by HEW showing that roughly 500,000 chemicals uh, are abound in this land, and less than 10% of them have been analyzed in any minimal degree for their side effects. 
And many of these, of course, are going not just into our industrial processes, but going into our products and foodstuffs, so forth. And I think our food regulation is, is uh, basically uh, uh, way, way behind the needs. There are not enough staff, not enough monies. Uh, GM takes in more in four hours than, uh, of a given 24-hour day than is devoted to food regulation by the Food and Drug Administration. To give you an illustration, uh, the GM takes in $2.3 million an hour, uh, 24 hours a day. Takes in more than any foreign government except Britain and USSR. And the combined annual budget of the Federal Trade Commission and the Antitrust Division, which are the policers of the economy, is uh, about $20 million, which is less than nine hours, you see. Now, that's not an all, all force comparison, obviously, but it does give you a bit of insight in how in the world can such a small manpower and technique and so forth can actually look over uh, such a massive economy. Uh, I think, uh, I, frankly, I think one of the next big consumer issues is going to be the nature of our food supply in terms of its what's going in it, what's being taken out of it, and so forth. Here again, uh, slowly you see the consumer is being turned into an imbecile. To give you an illustration, suppose you took somebody who was a consumer in 1850, you plunked them into the t middle of the 20th century, took him to a supermarket, and says, buy. The first thing he would do is take a package off the shelf, open it up, take the material out, and start looking at it. And if somebody said, well, you just don't do that anymore, you buy the package and hope that what's in it is good, he'd be, it would just be incredible. And you see, the, the, you see we, we go through these supermarkets, and we're told to buy things on the basis of certain warranties, certain brand names, and colorful packaging. Now, this is what I mean. As products become more complex, and as they become packaged, the burden of proof, the burden of responsibility, the safeguards become all the more insistent on the producer, because there's no possibility for that consumer to make this, the check necessary. And in our foodstuffs, we haven't looked at what's been going in our foods for years, for a lot of reasons. One is the effect is not traumatic. You know, by and large, people don't drop dead or killed like on the highway. It's a long-range insidious effect. And we're not used to this country to becoming indignant about, in, about subtle styles of violence. We become very indignant about crime in the streets, which takes an infinitesimal proportion of life in this country compared to auto crashes and what have you. We can become very indignant about primitive violent crime, but the insidious, long-range, silent violence of radiation and adverse chemical impacts and air and water pollution and nitrates and pesticides and what have you, we don't get very excited about. You see anybody, SDS, demonstrating here? See anybody uh, concerned about this problem? See, they can't focus it. They can't articulate it, explain it. They can't give it a personality uh, as of yet. But the day, I think, will come when uh, looking at the wholesomeness of our food supply will become perhaps half as important as napalm uh, in, in Vietnam and Dow Chemical, uh, which uh, probably does far more harm in some of its other products that it produces than the napalm. Uh, but you see, it's important to uh, ask ourselves the question, uh, can we uh, be stymied by the development of a kook sector? Now, one of the worst problems in giving attention to an issue is that if there is what is called a kook sector, you know, the food fattest, those people who gleam in their eye and they only buy dried apricots and they have their own newsletters, well, you realize that this has really inhibited a lot of uh, very prominent people uh, from speaking out in this area because their fear of being labeled as a fattest or a kook. So there is a style, you see, of scientific criticism that has to be looked into as well.
Well, there you go to the food and drug regulation process. They're not doing their job. For example, food and drug, uh, FDA in Washington long ago has given up doing anything about Coca-Cola. You know, that's not the all-American drink. You know. Yeah. Yes, yes. It's, I'll, I'll tell you what. The best analogy I can think of is that publishers can sell books by selling pornography and I can, you know, appeal to higher tastes and sell better product literature. You know, a customer can be appealed to on a whole spectrum. It's the most basest, aggressive instincts and far more realistic ones. What I'm saying is that for, for decades now, ever since 1928 when the style revolution got underway with GM's Harley Earl, the customer has been brainwashed and bombarded with this type of approach. Now, I, I submit that he would not be considered so idiotic or non-rational or emotional if he was given a different version or a different alternative in the amount of information over these years. And you can see the change in the last two years of more and more people asking about safety, appreciating it, and utilizing it. And I think this will grow. I think in Sweden, for example, which never went through this wild period of style, you have a much more sensible car uh, purchasing body. And it's just that way. I mean, you can develop it almost any way. You, one uh, Chrysler engineer once said that cars are merchandised like women's hats. That's a very uh, insightful statement, to, you know, in terms of product differentiation and uh, no consumer sovereignty in women's hats, you know. And a woman buys a hat, she doesn't ask how it's going to uh, wear under rain. Uh, very interesting comparisons that are hopefully giving way now. Someone asked about VW advertising. I'm very happy you did because here's an example of a very successful advertising campaign, particularly among educated people, uh, basically selling the most dangerous car in the United States today. There's no question that the VW, and some of the evidence is only a few blocks away in the medical school of UCLA, uh, where they have slides showing just how uh, collapsible the VW Japanese lantern really is under a collision. This is the most dangerous car on the road today in this country. It not only is an unstable vehicle, it gives very little collision protection, and it's just bad all the way around. Yet it's being sold in great numbers, heavily also, to uh, university people and people with college degrees. They love those ads. They're really clever ads, you know. Look how clever they are. They fo poke fun at Detroit. Uh, well, I, can, I look at it another way. The, the VW has transformed its own technological stagnation into a virtue. Look where it, it shows this beetle and it says, we dare you to tell the difference between this beetle and its predecessor 10 years ago. That's not a source of pride, you know. And it's this type of approach which has been very effective. And look who uh, it succeeded with. Anybody who buys uh, a vehicle like a Volkswagen for his children is clearly not a very prudent pa uh, parent. It doesn't take much knowledge to realize that the, the, that type of car up against a Chevrolet or a tree is not going to have much, uh, much protective capability. And yet uh, the sales are going. In fact, this is becoming, uh, Volkswagen is getting into trouble. I mean, they just paid out $800,000 in a settlement to a paraplegia case here in Los Angeles uh, because of an allegation for, uh, of unstable design that led the car out of control into a crash. They're now being sued around the country on this basis. Uh, statistical studies coming out of Massachusetts and New York are targeting this as having double the rate of crash incidents of other cars, uh, all other things being equal in terms of proportion of the population and so forth. So it's heading into a, a problem. In, in France, they say, you know, formerly it was the German army, now it's the Volkswagen. I'm afraid that is all the time we have. Um, no more SDS questions today. And uh, I want to thank Mr. Ralph Nader very, very much for coming and um, spending some time with us and answering our questions. Thanks again. Thank Okay, good, I'm hungry. <laughs>